Old Trafford Heritage and History Project intergenerational practice is a commitment to bringing young people and older people together to help break down barriers which threaten tolerance and understanding. Aside from the potential impact on communities, the benefits to the individuals can be far-reaching. This may include increased self-confidence, increased self-esteem, developing reciprocal relationships, and for older people in particular, improved health and well-being and reduced isolation. I was born in Jamaica and I came to live in Manchester in 1959. I came to England 1959. I was born in the area, actually, in Shrewsbury Street. I was born in Moss Side, uh, Manchester. And then when I was about three, we moved to Old Trafford. We moved into Old Trafford in 1980. Um, before that, I lived in Trafford Park. Before that, I lived in Withinshaw. And then uh, before that, Moss Side, where I was brought up. Uh, so I've been here like 30 years now in Old Trafford. I uh, currently live on Brooklands Road in Sale, near Manchester, and since 1993 or so. And uh, before that, I lived in uh, Old Trafford from about 1971. We decided to settle here in Old Trafford on September the 19th, 1976. But the house we moved into, we were in for 45 years. And the area was great. We de chose Old Trafford because of the access to the schooling, mainly. And then when you get your money, you save it. You save it because you need, you need something special. Well, I did need a house. We decided we wanted to stay here because, A, the area is fantastic, the history of the area is fantastic, and it's a, a very central place. Everybody knew each other and everybody looked out for each other. I was born in... Um in Lahore, which is now part of Pakistan, and uh, this uh, happened about uh, two or three years before partition took place, between, and, and, and uh, Pakistan was created as the British left uh, India. It, it was a good feeling all round, even when I moved into the 80s. In the 80s, it was a good, all, my experience in Old Safford, it was a good feeling all round. You know, I mean, Sir Alphonsus, it, this is what I've been told by my brother. On a, on a Friday night at the, at the, old, the Shrewsbury Hotel, St Alphonsus had what he called a men's night, a men's fraternity night, a smoker's night it was called, in the room upstairs. He had a function room upstairs then. And they used to just gather and have a few pints and that. And other, ch other churches were invited, anybody could go, you know what I mean? It was brilliant. And the Polish club had dances. We didn't have we didn't have the the the, the club we got set off on system, you know. And the seat and and the, the seat community was booming again. They they were quite they did integrate a lot, you know. It was brilliant. Um, I mean, I've been to four seat weddings since I've lived in Old Trafford. The Sikhs basically come from Punjab, which is the homeland of the Sikhs. And uh, when the country was divided and Pakistan was created half of Punjab became, uh, came in Pakistan. So all the, the Sikhs and Hindus who were in that uh, area then had to transfer into to the Indian side of Punjab. The house I was brought up in where had an outside toilet. It had gas lighting until I was 18. I lived in one house with eight people and we shared one bath. There was a bathroom and we shared one stove in Shrewsbury Street we had three cellars, washing cellar, a coal cellar and the food cellar. So when we looked around we found uh, Old Trafford properties were quite um, sizeable, they were within more or less our reach uh, and uh, the, the community was very friendly and welcoming so we actually bought a house in Old Trafford and uh, I think we moved in 1971-72. People were very friendly, we had very good neighbours and uh, we enjoyed, enjoyed uh, our life there and I actually got married when I was still living at Old Trafford and um, the wedding took place at the Sikh temple in Wally Range just down the road from there and um, all my three children were born in, in Reynolds Road. Great, great community spirit. 
Um, even like when I moved in in the 80s, there's a lot of people moved from Trafford Park with me. The, the Asian community moved from Trafford Park and they all live on Stanley Street now. And every time I see them on the street, even the, the, the siblings of the elders, oh, John, it's not like it, it's not like Trafford Park. You know, it's great in Trafford Park, wasn't it? Yeah, everybody. I said, well, it's great here, yeah, everybody's, everybody, it's just a bigger community. So, well, yes, it was nice. Very uh, good community feeling in those days, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Um, people were so friendly, uh, crime rate was virtually unknown. You could leave your front door open and go out to the shops and there would be no problem. People often left their front doors uh, unlocked. I think what games we played, I think in a way a lot of them are playing now. You never remember the rainy days when you had to stay in, but there must have been some. You remember the days when you were out, we used to play um, hopscotch. We all had skipping ropes, the girls, and there was spinning, spinning tops. Kick can run. Tag, hide and seek. We played marbles in the coal grids. Did you play Catch a Girl, Kiss a Girl? But... Kiss a Girl, yeah, at school, yes. <laughs> it was more community minded because you were playing with other children more. Children uh, from the beginning of time have played these games in a way, but as each generation has come along, they've got a bit more sophisticated. to uh, All Saints High School, which no longer exists. It was demolished when the Monk Union Way was built. Well, I went to um, Seymour Park Primary, and then I moved to Seymour Park Secondary Modern Senior School. Don't ask me why they called it a secondary modern, because there was nothing modern about it. It had outside toilets, it was cold and it was damp. I was at Loretta High School, but I did I couldn't stay on then. It was much more, much more important for the boys to stay in school and have a career than it was for the girls. I went to Old Trafford Community School, it's called now, but it used to be called Old Trafford Primary School. Mostly they were very strict because they knew they could get away with it. Um, they didn't have the rules and regulations that they have now. They got more respect from children, I think. We got up to Pranks, but we didn't sort of get up to a lot of what children get up to now. Secondary school was not as um, positive in terms of the t uh, there was corporal punishment, so there was a lot of uh, caning and beating of uh, the, the the pupils. Well, some people are for it, but me personally, I'm, I'm against corporal punishment. Parents sort of looked up to teachers. It was a profession that was respected. I don't think it's respected anymore, um, but. Um, I think quite rightly they shouldn't have the power that they had in those days because they had the power to make or break a child, they really did. Um, if they didn't think a child was up to things they would belittle them in front of other children and this sort of thing and I don't think that's right. It's very, very wrong, you know, this sort of thing. But um, if you went to the senior school I went to, you finished school at 15 and went to work um, if you went to the grammar school, you stayed on an extra year till you were 16 and went to work when you were 16, unless you were fortunate enough to go on to university. But um, it was very difficult because your parents had to pay for such a lot and if your parents didn't have the money, then you didn't. Ladies liked to go in pubs, men went in pubs, ladies didn't go in pubs. <laughs> when I started drinking, <laughs> to the shrew, and to the Plotford, and to the legs of man, and to the... <laughs> Women were expected to stay at home and look after the children. If you were single, you went to the cinema. The Bullcourt, the Globe. The Luxor, uh, the Trafford. The Imperial. Wally Range and um, you went to dance halls. There was one on Oxford Road. The Locarno. Cadman's. The Court School of Dancing. With all the 
cinemas, the pictures, the dance studios, we were never stuck. Um, the uh, palace and you had uh, the opera house and um, you could go there and they got big stars, uh, I'm talking stars of the day, um, like the Beatles, Tommy Steele, Cliff Richard when he was starting out, um, all the, I know they're old hat now but I'm talking about when I was younger those were big name stars. They all came and played in Manchester. They used to say, what Manchester does today, London does tomorrow. After an hard day's work, there was plenty of watering holes. I just mentioned four pubs at the Trafford Arms, which it's not there now, but that was just on, you, you, you had the, the Platford on this corner of Oskine Street, and on that corner, you had another pub called the Trafford Arms. That was pulled down many years ago. So you had one, two, three, four pubs we walking distance. We used to have a house party every Saturday night. Every Saturday night, you know. Yeah. We have a house party. Tonight they come by me next week, we go by somebody else. And we, you know, we used to have some fantastic time. And then you had the, a little one at the back, the Albert on Erskine Street, which, that was a small, a small pub, but it was a good card school pub then. Everybody went in to play cards Sunday dinner. And then he had the Luxa Club, which was, that was a nightclub, where he had some of the top acts of Manchester, and even today. We always listen to reggae, you know, reggae and um, Calypso, you know, Mr. Sparrow and um, Lord Kitchener, you know, uh, Bob Marley, you know, he was one of the top one, you know, he's the leader of reggae, you know. And the Telstar Club, everybody went in the Telstar Club, which was one of the big houses, walking up from, from Henrietta Street, turn left onto Stretford Road and walking up to Trafford Bar, the big houses on the right hand side. There was a couple, I think there was an Irish couple who owned it, but it was very sociable and it was great. So that's where you'd probably start off. So you could start off there, and by the time you got to All Saints, if you had half in every pub on Stretford Road, you, you knew about it, you know, but it was loads to do. When I was before I was married, obviously, I, you know, you do more socialising. You, you go to the pubs and you go to parties. Before we started our own cricket team, uh, I was playing for with uh, another cricket team based in the Mosside area, and um, we, uh, you know, we had good events then. Most of the players um, from that team uh, originally came from Trinidad, so you know, after the cricket match, there would be you know, a carnival feeling. We would quite often go to the pub if there was a pub nearby. And uh, we go to, to to their house on, you know, when there were functions and um, when they cooked great food. In the early 60s, on, um, you know, they did have these big radiogram. They didn't have no sonic system. They, they get those, I think in the late 70s, you know, they get those. But they used to have some big radiogram, you know. And the radiogram, when they put it on, you know, you could stay miles ahead, you know. That's the, we used to go in the cellar, cellar party um, weekend. In a house across the road, they did have a shabin in the cellar. And that didn't go down very well with the neighbours, I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't good. Illegal drinking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was... And I know there was one... Mm, let's not go into that because I went to that one. Oh, did you go to that? <laughs> yeah, when I was growing up and working behind the bar. <laughs> after that, after that, after that. Uh, after time, they said, oh, this is your being there, because a lot of it, a lot of people went, you know. And so we went, it was great, we had a great time. <laughs> but eventually they closed that down. <laughs> well, I started out as an as a office junior in Metro Vicks. In a metropolitan vicars in Trafford Park, they were huge. When I came here, I um, first went to Tonus Asbestos. 
I didn't like the job at all. But I, the, this one thing about that, if you were trained at Metro Vicks, you didn't need any references. You got your training at Metro Vicks and you were in. I don't know if there's any firms like that now. You know, Turner's Asbestos, it, it was a very dangerous place to work. My first job was working in the market, in Smithfield Market, the old Smithfield Market. And the chap said to me that they had never eaten a banana until after the war. I just couldn't believe it. When you work in there, you don't know the danger that you're in until a long, long time. Well, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Originally, I wanted to be a PE teacher. But when I realised that the, what I thought the PE curriculum or school, school's education curriculum wouldn't suit me, so I thought I'd, I'd, um, I'd be a sports um, instructor or a footballer. Then I went to Dunlops at Cambridge Street and I worked there for 39 years. I worked there and I, until I retired in 99. A lot of people like me there, you know, Dunlops, you know. I, it's one thing I get along with everybody. I ran a youth club in Oldham, and then I worked in Moss Side with people like Charlie Moore, Hartley Hanley, Billy Hughes, and I, in actual fact, I was the first community centre ward. So when I was around 17 or 18, I was I was really good in United and City wanted me to sign, but like I said before, I wasn't really committed. I've always been involved in youth and community work. And as a result of that um, commitment to young people, the time came when I wanted to be much more involved in decision making. So after I left uh, university, I became a youth worker. And I worked in um, Old Trafford Youth Club and Moss Side Youth Club. So I had the sort of like best of both worlds. I could do my job, do my football, and also go to nightclubs at weekends. One of the councillors died. I was just thrown into the deep end <laughs> to be a local councillor, and um, I've been a councillor since 1993. Always for Old Trafford in Clifford Ward, a Labour councillor at that. When I was 28, I got a master's to sign for Wrexham FC. So I signed for them. And then I left there. Uh, a year later and went to Bury Football Club. But five years after that, I got asked to be a professional again when I was 36 at uh, Doncaster Rovers. So I became a professional there for two years and helped take them out of the Football League. It was the first time they'd ever been uh, relegated out of the official Football League. <laughs> well, I started off as a jobber in Mossai with a plumbing firm. Uh, and it was on Cream Street, and I was only 15 when I left school. For my first job I had was on, on Deansgate at Tom Davis Motors, and selling motorbikes and everything, you know, looking after the showroom. And then I got a job in my, near her own, um, a plumbing firm called Peter Hunts. I started working as an apprentice for an engineering company uh, near Old Trafford evening classes, I uh, attended uh, uh, Manchester Polytechnic, I did my high national diploma in business studies there. That's now the Metropolitan University, but it was Manchester Polytechnic in those days. I also did uh, some engineering studies at uh, Salford Polytechnic, which is again a university now. But everything was done by Ankar. So if I was doing, if we were doing work over this side, I had to go to Browns or Griffiths, and sometimes I load me anchor up with mortar and then push it to Wally Range or even to Longsite. You know, and then, and then from, I was only there two years, and then I went in. My dad got me a, um, a job in the industrial roofing with Andersons, and I was there till 1963 when we all got laid off with a, with a very bad weather. Um, so my education was, um, further education was on a part-time basis because I needed to carry on working as well at the same time and bring some income into the family. Back into another roofing firm and I was there till late 70s, 80s and then I went into shipping, where I was in shipping, with my son-in-law George Lennigan. And uh, he taught me everything in that, and that's where I finished up before I had my heart attack in '94. Since then, 
have just been plunged into the, the community, the needs of the community as a community worker. So work-wise, um, I started as an apprentice, as I mentioned, um, on, uh, in Trafford Park, in fact, for, for an engineering company. And then after that, I moved to another engineering company um, for a couple of years. And then I um, went to Bolton um, because there was a, an opening there for a, a junior test engineer. Um, so I applied and uh, I got the job and I worked there for two, three years, but it was uh, very difficult to travel from Manchester to Bolton every day. I was in the Templeton District League and that year, that year, the young lads there, they hadn't played together and we coached them and I was coaching at the school at the time and we got them together. That, uh, and they won the third division. They won. They came third in the, in that division, and they beat uh, Sale, not Sale. Sorry, Wimslow in the cup at Trafford United at Trafford Ground. That there for the first season, it was brilliant. And and so it just progressed from there. Um, so then I uh, got a job in. Uh, um, another lo very large company in Trafford Park, which sadly um, finished quite some time ago, but was very well known in the area. And they made very large um, uh, electric motors and, and dynamos. And um, I was working as a test engineer there. It was fantastic for them because a lot of the youngsters at the time in the community the self-esteem was very low and this brought the best of them. Like they had kids like young Craig Monaghan, Mike Lusbans, he went on to United but didn't want to do it. Anthony Corbett, I could go on naming them for a while but they were good kids and some of them are still playing for us in the senior league. Mark, Mark, Marcus King and that and, and Mike Lusbans, Pete Maguire still with us. Pain's like, but they're still with us. Well, my mum came originally from the Lake District in Ulverston. Parents came to England in the late 50s. One came from St Kitts in the Caribbean and my mother came from Ireland. Her father worked on the docks and he used to travel around the country because he, he, he used to follow the work. We were very lucky. We had a very uh, uh, brave and heroic mother uh, who was left on her own to bring us, and there were three of us, um, across to India. Um, one of the relatives was supposed to go and find her and help her, but uh, he didn't arrive uh, or didn't find her. So we were two or three months uh, in transition, uh, travelling on trains, sometimes walking, sometimes sitting on train roofs because they were so crowded. And because bandits and um, gangs were killing each other, um, actually coming onto the trains and killing people, uh, the trains were sometimes just stop for two or three days in one place. And if they did move, they might move maybe half a mile and stop again. My father worked on the docks, which is how we come, they come to be in Manchester. Dad coming from St Kitts, um, it was part of the Commonwealth and they, and they um, sort of almost worshipped the Queen. My dad was a deep sea fisherman, but when the war came, he couldn't fish because the, the seas were mined. And so the government said, would you come and work on the docks in Manchester, which is what he did. And he got work on Salford docks. So, of course, the whole family up to up sticks again <laughs> and moved to um, Salford. And then 12 months later, they said, well, seeing as you're going to be here a bit longer than we thought, because the war's lasting longer than we thought it was going to last, we will pay for your family to come and live in Old Trafford. Well, to live in Manchester area. As it happened, it was Old Trafford. And then when my mum eventually married my dad, who lived in Broughton, they then 
got this house in Shrewsbury Street when they married, you see. My parents were quite elderly by the time they had me because I'm the youngest of 11 children. And I do remember once my mother saying that uh, we were on the, the roof of the train and, uh, and she was so tired and she, and she was falling asleep. So she tied her uh, long hair to one of us um, to, so that if she did fall or try to fall, then you know, one of us would wake up. And uh, it was very dangerous times. Interestingly enough, my mother died in 1999 and she was 99 years old. She would have been 100 years in 2000. Mum was 48, 10 days after I was born, which nowadays doesn't sound that old because people have children later. My dad died when I was 11 years old. In those days, you didn't tend to have children that late in life. And so it was really like being brought up by your grandparents. My father, at that time, unfortunately, he did, oh, didn't arrive. Um, to, to help us across. He was in Burma and he couldn't get back in time. So my mother took us across all, all on her own. And um, well, we, we never forget that. We, in all of us, we all heard our lives to her, really. I uh, was probably about three, probably about three years. Well, we were well looked after, even during the war. We never went short of anything because my auntie used to live in the country in Mansfield and she knew people who worked for the co-op and, <laughs> and other people. I mean, there used to be a lot of trips from Mansfield to Old Trafford, bringing suitcases back. And <laughs> so we never went short of anything. We were lucky. My dad was, um, was doing um, um, commercial sales at the time. Like a, like a traveling salesperson. Uh, but most of his time was actually spent helping the community. Uh, and, and in fact, all of his life, he's, he's, he served the community. Not only, not only just the Sikh community, but the Indian community, whoever needed his help, he was there to help them. Because my dad was an educated person, he was a graduate. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he had a great command of English, so People needed his help, not just from the language point of view, but his knowledge of the country, the, the laws, and uh, things like that. Some people talk about your identity and your belonging, and, what, and years ago people used to say, well, you were, you, were, you were born in England, but your parents weren't, so you don't really belong here. But now fast-tracking up to now, 2010, you're thinking, well, I feel very English, and, uh, and I feel very British, and I don't want any of our identity. My father was a seaman, so he came to England once. And um, in 1978, my mother spent some time in Connecticut with my brother and encouraged her to come to England. And she said, oh, I'm not coming to England because it's too cold. And I said to her, but you have never been. And at 90, when she was 98, she regretted that she didn't come to see what England was like. So um, that's what happened. My mum moved up here with uh, all of our three of her children. Three stayed behind because one sister was already married by then. And my brother was working and my sister was working, so they stayed behind. And um, she came. Twelve months later, I was born, and she said if she'd known what was waiting for her here, she wouldn't have come. And I think by that she means me. <laughs> My father was a uh, um, very religious person, a very moral person, and he uh, believed in the rights of everybody, religious rights as well as civil rights. And uh, he applied for a job with uh, the Manchester City Council to be a bus conductor, and he was turned down on the grounds that he didn't wear a cap or couldn't wear a cap. And that upset my father greatly. And so he started a campaign to have the law changed. And um, it took him over 10 years or so uh, to have the law changed. Eventually, there was a battle with the Manchester City Council. And uh, various meetings were, were held, and the City Council turned down the change in the law two or three times. But my father pressed on, you know, and uh, eventually he was able to convince the Manchester City Council that uh, um, 
to have Sikhs wearing a turban on, on, on the bus as conductors or drivers was just as good. So that, that was, you know, his first campaign. Sometimes amongst your peers or your own um, cultural group, they're not always as um, patriotic as you because they may have had negative experiences in England or, or issues around belonging or identity. But personally, I feel a great sense of loyalty to England. But uh, the ironic thing was that uh, by the time the law was changed and he could work on the buses, he, he was past the age. <laughs> so he never did get to, uh, to work on, on the bus, but uh, the first person, Sikh person, to work on the bus was in fact his, uh, his nephew. So that was close enough in the family anyway. When I went to get my MBE, um, she wrote to me and she said, well, you're going to see the Queen I hope your shoes are going to be very clean and shine and you must make sure you wear your top hat and your tails and that's what she wrote in my letter, you know, <laughs> because naturally there are people in the Caribbean, it's changing now, yes. they're royalists, they worship the Queen, every house you go you'll see a photograph of King George the Sixth and whatever, you know. In, in the Indian culture the politics and religion is always intertwined and more so probably than in the West, I think. And um, so he felt that, uh, you know, because of his religious conviction, uh, it wasn't fair that he, sh he ought to, he ought to, uh, uh, he has to take his turban off in order to, to work. My mother died when I was very young, I was 17. Um, and my father died five years ago. But I, n I never forget the um, education that they gave us and the upbringing. They were always working. They worked 24 seven if they could. And that then was the start of the, uh, the freedom uh, uh, for all the ethnic minorities to work anywhere without a uniform or, or a cap. So people were allowed to work in the police, for example, join the police force uh, and, uh, and other professions where previously they wouldn't have been able to. My parents was very, very, very good to us. I have, um, I, ha I have three sisters and um, myself. I, I did have another brother, but he died. And um, my dad was a um, carpenter. You call, it, you, you call it Jaina here, but we call it carpenter back home. And he was a fisherman and um, they used to work very hard to make ends meet, you know, and I used to work basically. They lived in Old Trafford till they died. They, uh, they used to, I always remember they used to do a lot of sayings, so they always say, oh, well, before you went to school you had to be very clean, but if you're talking to adults you had to use um, correct and good manners and, you know, be courteous and be respectful for elders. There's tons of sayings like, um, all that glistens is not gold, and uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. And, and his second campaign, which in fact all, was all conducted from Reynolds Road in Old Trafford, and, and it, that also took quite a few years, uh, was his campaign to have uh, the law changed to exempt Sikhs from wearing um, uh, helmets on bicycles. And uh, that was also very difficult. And uh, in the course of, of that, he went to, uh, uh, to prison for a week, as strange ways. Um, and uh, it's quite a long you know, story and complicated procedure. But eventually, yes, it went to the, to, uh, to the Houses of Parliament and the, the law was changed there. So the Sikhs were exempted from wearing a helmet. It did, yes, yes. They made the newspapers not only here but also all over the world where, you know, Sikhs obviously took a great deal of interest. I think they had um, what we term now old-fashioned values and I've still got those old-fashioned values and I try to instill them in my children and I just think um, you just can't beat having good manners and Brian at a wedding <laughs> in 19, the end of 1963, by which you will have assumed I was an unmarried mother. I didn't have a white wedding. 
We couldn't afford much. We had no money. We never had any much money to spare. <laughs> and um, it was my nephew's wedding. I met Brian at. And at the time, he had seen me at the church in the afternoon talking to my brother-in-law. And, and we got married at St Bride's. The morning of my wedding, I was spent running around the shops collecting, because we had the, the reception at home. You, you did those. You, you, you always, they were always at home parties. <laughs> and at the reception at the night time, there wasn't a seat available and he jokingly said, you can sit on my knee if you like, and I did. And um, it, it sort of shocked him because he thought my brother-in-law was going to thump him because he thought that was my husband. I'd arranged, we'd arranged that I should go and get changed at my cousin's. And he and his family were coming to my house, you see. And then... Um, <laughs> I'm still flying around, sort of trying to sort things out. And they said, "Oh, they're coming down the street. They got the bus. You don't have taxis. You got a bad bus. They got. They all got the bus. Him and his family and walked out. And so, eventually, he found out it wasn't. And um, we started going out together. And we got married eight months and eight days later. And we're still married now. So." You can work it out for yourself. On the 8th of August, I celebrate my 46th wedding anniversary. He dressed his car up and he said, well, you're not walking to church. <laughs> so he, he said to put some white ribbons and stuff on his car and he drove me around. My, my wife, uh, she, she come, comes from India and uh, I, I met her at her sister's house in Rochdale and um, it was a, a more or less love at first sight. We got married, you know, within two or three months of meeting. And uh, so uh, she's, a, she's a great person and a great cook. I think I've really, I think I've been more or less pretty much happy but most of my life really. I've been lucky. Even though it's been hard work, I've been, worked hard, worked very hard till I was 60 and I've had three, the children to bring up. And the happiest memory has to be, I can't say that there is one, uh, there's several. Uh, one of them would be when I got married and uh, the other theory would be when I got three wonders of the modern world, which are my three children. I can't say <laughs> that anything was happier other than when my daughter and my son got married. Uh, they were also very happy occasions. But the happiest is every weekend, Saturdays, or training or coaching. <coughs> When I see the lads who's come through doing what they're doing, that makes me happy. I think Old Trafford is is uh, is a very great place for family people to live because uh, the community is is very friendly, very sociable. Uh, the amenities and the facilities that are provided by by the the um, the Trafford Council uh, are very good. Very good. You, know, you can't uh, want for anything if you live in Old Trafford. And um, I was sad to uh, to leave Old Trafford when we did, but uh, it was necessary because we needed uh, a larger um, larger house for a growing family. I would say there's there's parts of it that have been absolutely brilliant and I've really enjoyed. Um, it's also been punctuated by the grief and pain of losing your parents and people you love but overall I could say I've done fairly well I could have done better but I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy at the moment with my lot. I spoke to a group of young people and they asked have you met you know I've met Mohammed Ali I've met Viv Richards I've met the Queen twice and um, so many people that have met footballers, you know, sitting around the table, having dinner with them. Fantastic, you know. Um, I've been to Manchester United because as a mayor, you get two tickets to go to United. 
and what I all yeah absolutely sit in the box there and one of the things I was able to do and I feel good that I did that was to take youngsters along you know instead of taking my wife I would say to you know would you like to come along and one youngster is a is about he was 13 at the time and I was mayor 2003 he still talk about it I'm walking hey Mr. Stennett can you get some more tickets for me to go to United <laughs> you know that was really good I don't think there's enough for the families in Old Trafford. Um, I think it was nice. And we could go a picnic. Even if you lived here, you could go in the park and have a picnic. Not an elaborate picnic, just a, some sandwiches and, and some lemonade or some water if you couldn't afford the lemonade. But you were there as a family and picnicking and you were doing the things as a family together with all the young ones and that. And uh, I, I think that is very, very important. And the gardens in Holland used to be beautiful. They are bringing them up now, but uh, they are trying hard. And we keep on getting the green flags, so we must be doing something right. They used to say what Manchester does today, London does tomorrow, because all the shows opened in Manchester first to see if they got a good review, and if they got a good review, then they moved them to London. So um, they've always, Manchester has always led the way. And by Manchester I don't mean just Manchester City Centre, I mean Manchester, Trafford, the whole area. Uh, we've always led the way. Cricket, football, anything you like to name it, we, we've done it before London did it. If I win a million pounds, I wouldn't want to leave Old Trafford. Because I'd say I'm quite happy in Old Trafford, I'll die in Old Trafford. Um, but yeah, it's a fantastic place and all we need to do, get all the groups working together and move forward with that positiveness in mind. No really, I just, the last thing sorry, is that um, the value of history and heritage to me is really important that we um, keep trying to help young people and our communities to develop and we can help them develop by sharing our stories because I think ordinary people often have extraordinary stories.